Welcome to the Craftsman Founder Podcast, hosted by Lucas Carlson. Every week, we talk to founders, entrepreneurs, and those who've made a craft out of creating companies and enterprises. Listen every week to get ideas for starting, promoting, and growing your business. There are no shortcuts, just good old-fashioned hard work and craft. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's interview. Hello, this is Lucas Carlson. And this is L.A. Pepper. And this is the Craftsman Founder Podcast. Uh, one of my early, early interviews was with a wonderful, wonderful author named Michelle Miller, who wrote a great book, and at the time it was self-published, and it was called The Underwriting. And I'm super, super excited to have her back because uh, she has some really big news, uh, and she wants to share it with us. So, Michelle, thanks for coming back, and, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me back. So, it's what's your news? You. Well, um, so I initially published the underwriting last time I was on. I was publishing it as a serial online, and uh, we actually sold the print rights to Penguin. So it's coming out as a as a bona fide novel in hardback and everything. Um, oh wow, that's the real thing. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's real. No denying it. Um, on May twenty sixth, it'll be out in stores, and it's sold in twenty countries. So um, wow. so we're selling it into lots of languages. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's been really fun. That's super exciting. So uh, for people who haven't yet learned about the novel or what it's about, can you give us like the elevator pitch for it? <laughs> Definitely. Um, so <laughs> The End of the is a satirical corporate thriller about Wall Street and Silicon Valley. It follows six characters through the events of the initial public offering of a location-based dating app, which is to say that uh, it kind of deals with Wall Street and Silicon Valley from the perspective of six under 30-year-olds trying to make it in this world. And uh, you actually coined a word, is that right? I coined what word? Uh, did I heard something about uh, you coining a word? Uh, 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 muppies. Muppies, yeah. Muppies, yeah. <laughs> I did. Huffington <laughs> Post <laughs> called um, called introducing the muppies about millennial yuppies. Yes. <laughs> I, I, Yep, it's um, changed a bit because of the financial crisis. We we can't import caviar, maybe like uh, like predecessors in the '80s did. But there's <laughs> a lot of locally sourced organic kale now. Um, so trying to <laughs> we invented yuppie for this era. Cool. Well, it's a really fun book. Uh, let's rewind and remind people more about your background. How'd you get into writing? Definitely. So I have a very corporate background. I um, went to school in California. After undergrad, I became a consultant. And then I went back to business school and graduated in 2011. While I was in business school, I dabbled in a lot of startups, but ultimately needed to pay back my loans. And so um, I took a job at JP Morgan so in the private bank on Palo Alto. <laughs> yeah. Um, and while I was there, it was a, during the Facebook IPO, so I had a really interesting seat to um, to all that was going on in terms of startups and people making it and people not making it, and those dynamics that were at play. But while I was in business school, I also started taking writing classes just as a creative outlet, and really, really fell in love with it. So, um, so I started writing under pseudonyms. I did several blogs under pseudonyms. I did a series of young adult novels under pseudonyms. I'll just sort of define my sea legs and figure out if it's some Thing that I wanted to do. Um, so then when I paid back my loans, I decided to, to really pursue it. So I quit my job in 2013 and um, started writing the underwriting. I didn't really know what I was doing <laughs> in terms of publishing. I think publishing, especially from the outside, is just an enormously daunting process. How do you find an agent? How do you find a publisher? How do you get a book written, much less on shelves? And so um, so I did what I knew how to do, which was do a startup. So I raised money and, um, and created an LLC and then wrote the book but started publishing it serially online. So every week I would release a chapter. They took about 30 minutes to read. They were free for 24 hours or you could buy them for $1.50. And how did you build up your audience? How did you find people to read? Um, a lot of social media, but I think the the bigger thing was that it, my social media network was one thing, but um, but it's uncomfortable self promoting. I, I, I wasn't really a fan of like read my writing, um, and so I got a lot of other people involved in the project, and so I had a lot of transmedia elements again because I was putting it up on a website. There was a lot of opportunity to do. Um, 
to do transmedia. What I've since discovered is called transmedia things. So there were DJ playlists every week. There was a video trailer. We had brand sponsors every week. The audio books were read by six different actors. There were a lot of finance terms in the novel. So I had um, finance tutorials. And so each of those were done by a different person. Um, and I was sort of cognizant of having lots of different people in different cities. So my DJs were in London, my video guy was in Chicago, my actors were in LA. And by the end of the day, um, there were 40 people involved in the project who all had a vested interest in putting it on their Facebook walls. So that sort of helped to spread amongst very different social networks globally. Cool. And so then talk to us about how you transitioned from self-publishing into traditional publishing. Yeah, you know, to me, I think writing is becoming a lot like the music industry, where as a first-time writer, it's really um, an opportunity, but also an important thing to put your work up online and find the audience, and then you're going to have more success when you do take it to publishers, um, both in terms of the leverage that you have for a deal, but also in terms of your ability to maintain your creative vision, because I think you have this ability to point to this audience that you've proven. And so a lot like an artist who, uh, or, or a musician who puts their work up on Spotify or an actor who does a web series so that agents find them, I think it's a great way for writers um, to get to break into the industry. Yeah, that's a really interesting approach, and I think it's becoming more and more common, but it wasn't common until recently, that the whole concept of self-publishing into traditional publishing as kind of a um, uh, getting discovered is kind yeah. of uh, a, a new trend. So we, we saw people like Andy Weir with, uh, with The Martian uh, do that, and, and before that, Hugh Howey uh, with, with Wool. But those were kind of one-offs, and it seems like this is becoming less one-off and more, uh, it's becoming more of, uh, self-publishing is becoming kind of a stage uh, for traditional publishers to pick up indie authors. Is that oh, kind of how you're seeing it too? I, I am seeing it that way, and I think it's a really great thing. For me, it's sort of um, a reconciling of this doesn't have to be some competition between the self-publishers and the traditional publishers. In fact, it can be this really cohesive thing. Um, because frankly, like it, it is pretty low risk and pretty low cost to put your work up online. So why not do it and then prove it so that then when the publisher does invest their time and money, um, they kind of have, they have less risk, which I do think as an artist, you have to be cognizant of the economics that publishers are dealing with too. And, uh, you know, I, I've actually noticed recently a number of the big five have been specifically hiring acquisition editors that's, whose job is to scrape self-published lists. That's so so it's, it's actually explicit, um, yeah. which, is, which is pretty interesting. That's very interesting. Uh, how did, how, so how did that, you know, like one of the, as you said, there, there's often in, in the sort of blogosphere, I guess, there's, there's often this dichotomy set up of like, either you're a self-published author and everybody, and if you're in that crowd, everybody likes to yell about how amazing it is to be your own person and have control. Uh, or you're a traditionally published author, in which case a lot of people like to yell about how that's really the only real way to, to get noticed or, or to build an audience. And I think that obviously both are blind to the, the pros and cons of each other. Um, right. So, how, you know, now you've straddled that boundary yourself, yeah. right? So, so what, what have you, you told a little, us a little bit about what you've learned um, mm -hmm. by, by releasing the series yourself. What have you learned as you started to collaborate both on the pros and cons of, of working with a large publisher? Yeah, definitely. Uh, let me think about how to answer that question. There's a lot there. Um, I guess uh, to make a smaller yeah. version of the same question, why did you go with uh, Penguin instead of continuing self-publishing? I always wanted a traditional <laughs> publishing. I always wanted a book on shelves. You know, I, I did always want a book on shelves. And, um, and I think for me, I also published initially serially. And serial to me is a really exciting form. But it's also a different form. It, it's kind of like painting versus photography. Um, and so I think adapting the serial, which I did on my own online, because there frankly like isn't any platform 
though there are a lot, there are a lot in the works, um, to publish serially. That was a great way to, to experiment with that form. And then I translated it into a novel. And honestly, I mean, my editor was monumental. She was so tremendous. And um, the marketing team at Penguin has been so thoughtful. And, um, and, and, you know, there are just certain aspects of the publishing process that are really, you, you just can't do on your own yet. I'm not saying that we won't get there, but in terms of distribution and printing books, um, it's, it's just really hard to do. So if you want to just have an ebook, then I think self-publishing is a great way to go. But I did, I did always want, um, want a hardback. <laughs> and and uh, so one of the things that you did get, uh, Penguin's been doing a great job marketing. You've been showing up in some magazines. Which magazines have been shown up in? Oh, we got um, Cosmo and Glamour, where their summer read, and uh, Departures, or yeah. in Departures, and um, and a big spread in Self coming wow. up in the summer. So yeah, that's very very hard for a self published author to pull off on their own. You know, I mean, that's, it's that's, that's also hard for a traditionally published author. Uh, I think, I mean, you're you're obviously getting getting good work out of the marketing team. Well, I hope it's you know, I think this story. I hope it's a story that resonates with a lot of people. It was meant to be very, um, very of the moment, and so so it means a lot that people are resonating with the characters and and catching on. But I completely agree with you. I think that you know, I felt like a lot of the marketing I did when I self published was really. Uh, was really clever and innovative, but at the end of the day, there is just this, you know, once you see behind the wings, you really see that it is just about having the right person to make the right call. And then it, it feels very fluid, but it's hard to get in that system. Um, and it just hasn't broken down yet. You know, I think we're getting there. The internet is helping us get there, but we're just not to a totally democratic taste making uh, world yet, unfortunately. So what inspired you to write the book? What, what was the flame that got it started? I, oh gosh, um, when did it start? I think I, I had a class in business school, my second year of business school, I was in class on the entertainment industry. And Neil Baer, who was the creator of ER, was teaching. And he, um, he said something <laughs> about creating ER. And he said the best thing he ever did for ER was he went to Harvard Medical School. And so he really knew that world. And prior to ER, everyone said you could never make a TV show about medicine. It was just way too complicated. And I was sitting in the audience kind of thinking about investment banks. And it was right in the middle of Occupy Wall Street. And I was like, you know, I mean, I, I think Wolf of Wall Street is a tremendous movie. I love Wall Street. But nothing really got to kind of the humanity behind Wall Street and the people who were actually working in it and the pressures that they felt in a really complex way. And so... Um, so I started thinking, was it possible to create a, a show about that if you really understood the inside? And then I felt the same way about Silicon Valley, to be honest. I felt like a lot of the commentary was very nonfiction and very biased. And I really wanted to show all the complexities of being an entrepreneur or of having a startup or of being at that company that's about to be worth a billion dollars in your life changing overnight. And so, so both of those were really interesting topics to me. Um, and yeah, and that was, that was kind of the germ of what became the underwriting. That's awesome. I think that's really interesting. And for me, uh, it was interesting because I kind of had that same similar germ where it's like, I wanted to write and I wanted to write about startups. But, uh -huh. uh, and it seemed like startups at first were such a easy thing to write fiction about. Like people know that there's lots of drama in startups. So it seems like it should be easy. Right. But then what you find out is that it's not as easy as it first looks on the surface <laughs> because the drama within a lot of startup environments is not actually uh, the kind of drama that, that suits itself well to fiction naturally. It's, yeah. it's a lot, it, it, it's kind of hard. I no, I wouldn't have assumed this coming into it, but it's actually, right. it takes uh, uh, approaching it from a different angle. Like you said, the human angle. Right. And understanding it first from the human angle, not from the startup angle. Yeah. And it uh, only just, happens to be a startup surroundings uh, in order to make it work. That's really interesting. Do you think that I, I often, I feel very similarly that I think character is always what should come first. At least in my, it's what I care most about. And um, 
And I think for me, the underwriting is is as much a story about muppies. It's it's about what it's like to <laughs> <laughs> in your late twenties, early thirties, right now, and that necessarily had to be set on Wall Street and in Silicon Valley because I think those are two such definitive um, definitive pillars of of that existence. But that's a really good point that you make. I think that if you start with the setting or if you start with just the plot you miss the humanity and you really do have to start with the characters. Yep. I mean, I think, yeah, good stories are about people, right? Because I mean, even if you look, the, the, the example you gave, ER, I mean, that's not a show that's about medicine at all. Yep. <laughs> it's a show that's about the relationships between people working in an ER. So, and I think <laughs> an interesting era, I think television has really opened up this world where you can explore really complex characters that aren't necessarily likable. Um, you know, I look at Tony Soprano and I don't think 20 years ago you ever would have thought that you could have a sustainable relationship <laughs> with a really awful, arrogant mobster. <laughs> but here We're we breaking are. Breaking Bad, yeah. So I think yeah. it's fun that we can really, uh, you know, my characters are not likable people <laughs> at all. But I think at the end of the day, you, you do feel for them and you feel some compassion for what they're going through. Well, I think everybody listening should pick up the book. I think uh, <laughs> what I what I really believe is that uh, I think a lot of people think fiction is entertainment, but I think that you can learn so much about uh, the job of entrepreneurship by reading fiction. In fact, we've talked on this podcast that uh, fiction might actually be a better thing to read if you're trying to learn how to be an entrepreneur than nonfiction. Uh, but everyone should pick it up. The underwriting, find it in any bookstore now, thanks to being traditionally published, uh, but also <laughs> online, obviously Amazon. Uh, and Michelle, congratulations. I'd love to have you, you on so and much. talk about your next book, whatever uh, is coming up around uh, next time. So let's have you as a guest coming back on again. Great. Thank you so, so much, guys. Thank it's great you. to yeah, see sure. you. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Craftsman Founder Podcast with Lucas Carlson. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, craftsmanfounder.com, to your friends and colleagues. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a Craftsman Founder production. Join us next time for another edition of the Craftsman Founder podcast.